War never changes. Since the dawn of humankind, when our ancestors first discovered the killing power of rock and bone, blood has been spilled in the name of everything from God to justice to simple psychotic rage. Fallout. Fallout is often highly regarded as one of the cornerstones of the RPG industry. From its depictions of desolate wastelands, freakish super mutants, and depressingly bleak atmospheres, to its retro-futurism art style, Fallout makes an impression no matter the title. While many would argue that its catalog on the whole is mostly worthy of being called great, from the huge, bleak worlds to the sticky player agency that can alter the way the game rolls out, many elements of Fallout have been changed a lot as to become totally estranged from Interplay's initial creation. Once driven by different ideals from much different generations, one could fathom that Fallout has turned into something that is indeed both great and terrible. Fallout 1 was developed by Interplay, not Bethesda, in 1997, alongside the renaissance of classic games like GoldenEye, Star Fox 64, Turok, Oddworld, Final Fantasy VII, Grand Theft Auto, and The Curse of Monkey Island. This was a generation of gaming that saw the emergence of a variety of new and interesting game ideas, from shooting games putting stories first, to the reign of the console platformer and the dawn of the branching story-style RPG. 1997 also marked a time of both experimentation, such as with Blast Core on the Nintendo 64, and an improvement to core game genres like the original Shadow Warrior, and of course, Fallout. Fallout drew its influences from a game called Wasteland, in fact often being called its spiritual successor. Sprinkle in a little bit of Mad Max, sci-fi movies from the 40s and 50s, and a comedy of old-fashioned punchline comic books, and you pretty much have Fallout. But unlike the Fallout we know today, early versions of Fallout showed a much, much more dark and gritty experience set within the frame of an isometric camera. Fallout is a game about choice and making decisions within the confines of the fragmented, ruined societies that the game houses. The game begins in 2161, 84 years after the bombs had dropped in the Great War of 2077. The effects of the war are definitely here though unjaded, unfaded, and expose a crippled world populated by thin strands of those who can barely hang on to life. It's a post-nuclear story that shows how society has coped after it has been destroyed, though that picture is often not pretty. It's a somber tale of politics, capitalism, corruption, prejudice, lies, deceit, basic human need and struggle, and the misuse of various technologies. And of course, the play between multiple factions to acquire valuable and rare resources just to survive. All of these cool components are wrapped up around the prime evil of the game, the master's army of super mutants, and these guys are pretty ugly. You need to go find us another controller chip. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to retrieve a water chip to bring Vault 13's water recycling system back online, which malfunctioned and now threatens the lives of the people inside. At the beginning of the game, you are given a portable wrist computer called the Pip-Boy 2000, which tracks your progression, map making, objectives, and bookkeeping as well. And off you go, out into the world of Fallout. The best thing about the original Fallout games was the sense that its world was full of choices and consequences. You are free to go anywhere you want, yet Fallout does have several landmark moments to help you create the story just for you. You're given the choice to help defend the Shady Sands against raiders, or not. You can kill the mayor in Junktown, you can bring Gizmo and his corrupt police casino land to justice, or you can help him bring down Killian. You'll travel to a trading center called The Hub, where you can hire a water caravan to extend the water supply of Vault 13 by 100 days, or not. And you can even join the Super Mutant Army if you want to, and destroy Vault 13 instead, or kill the Overseer yourself and see what happens. 
This choice is what makes Fallout, and is supported quite nicely by the karma system, the reflection of how good or evil you have been. This is how the people of Fallout will look at you, and the populace has different dialogue options depending on how you act. It's subtle, but it does help align Fallout with the notion that everything has a cause and an effect. Supplementing the fantastic player-driven narrative was Fallout 1's controversial turn-based battle system and perk system called Special. Back in 1997, you gotta remember that turn-based systems were often preferred as overall video game pacing in RPGs was much slower back then. And while it's nothing special, the combat system does get the job done, albeit in a very janky way. The player utilizes action points, which are determined by his or her agility stat, which dictates the flow of each encounter. These stats are determined upon starting the game, allowing each player to customize how they want to approach the game. Combined with a variety of skills, traits, and perks you can pick up and choose yourself, these decisions lead to subtle changes that impact combat, dialogue, persuasion, lockpicking, capacity, healing, among others that make each playthrough of Fallout feel pretty unique. The original Fallout was awarded various Game of the Year titles and sold just over 200,000 units initially, compared though to 1 million of Baldur's Gate. While the game doesn't hold up tremendously well today, if you do transport yourself back to 1997, it is a game worthy of Fallout's imminent success. Fallout 2 was released a mere one year later, marking out a story 80 years after the original, and the mission was simple, make it bigger. Interplay was running into some very severe financial issues when the team set out to work on Fallout 2, which forced them to constrain the development cycle to a mere nine months. The team admitted that the goal was to make the game as big as Baldur's Gate despite this small development window, so the only option was to use the same template and expand it horizontally. So the not so ironic part about Fallout 2 is that it shares so many fundamental assets and ideas from the original game. So many in fact that you could at times consider them extensions from the same game. Yet, it does still feel exciting. The gameplay, engine, the overworld map, and the character creator are pretty much identical. And even the world uses much of the same asset toolkit from the first game. It's kind of hard to tell the two games apart, visually. But unlike Fallout's inconsistent writing, the stories told and lives presented here are what draw you in alongside the infamously dreary atmosphere. Back is Fallout's combat system, much to the chagrin of anyone who is too impatient for a turn-based tactical combat system, but this time it's been tidied up a bit and gives you more options to manage your party. Yet it does carry the same issues, as the player's skill is often determined more by how good their stats are versus how good their reflexes or skills are, so the combat system is definitely hit or miss. Thankfully to those not interested, not all the battles are required or combat-based. Back are companions too, should you meet the conditions to acquire them, often there are many. Though this time the system is better, casting a limit on the amount of companions you can use based off one half of your charisma level, and they do level up with you this time. I usually rolled with dog meat because I got sick of the other ones shooting my friends and yes that is a problem. But whether the gameplay appeals to you or not, what is easy to praise Fallout 2 for is being another interesting role playing game that allows you to tell the story. Its focus on player-driven narratives in such a bleak and oppressive world is something I'll never get out of my head. Fallout 2's wild stories play out organically, much to the same degree of player choice as was in the first game. Non-linearity at its best during the late 90s. In the end, it's the same Fallout game, kind of, just bigger and marginally improved. If you didn't like the first one, you probably won't like the second one. It doesn't do anything new, after all if it ain't broke, why fix it? Truth, though, I'd love to see the UI get redone, because that was quite a mess. Fallout 2 turned out to be a commercial success that recouped its budget three times over, yet it would be the last Fallout game from Interplay. Fallout went first person or over the shoulder if you chose when Bethesda purchased the rights to the property in 2007 and Fallout's third game released in October of 2008. To this day, no other game called out to me during this time than Fallout 3. For all intents and purposes, Fallout 3 does a lot right, yet has the black marks of a bad game too. Lackluster gunplay, saved only by the new VAT system, awful performance, bugs aplenty, 
and a lack of overall cohesion within the interactions of the player and the story as a whole. But what it does have is an incredible sense of atmosphere. The wastelands of Fallout 3 are captivating in a way that most games dream of. Stepping outside the vault, the world torn asunder, seeing the Washington Monument in the distance, is breathtaking. It's dark, black beauty, only a way that the tragedy of a Fallout could portray on the screen. And I recall fondly wandering around with no reason other than just to see what was out there because the atmosphere was so thick and interesting. The transformation in the first person made the exploration feel more real, despite the story being disjointed although that was fixed in New Vegas. I really love that the capital wasteland of DC also had so many secrets to explore and clues left in the game to find optional content, such as finding the remains of the insanity experiments within the vaults, finding out what happened to Tom McMullen inside the pits, or uncovering the answer to the secret Morse code mystery to find a secret supply cache. Fallout 3, like New Vegas and 4, had humor, wonderful personality, and a huge modding scene and DLC that extended the life of the game almost indefinitely for me. In fact, these three games have bigger communities today still than many other new games. Technically though, these games have not aged well, and the constant bombardments of clipping, bugs, pop-in, or frame stuttering don't do anything to serve today's audience, nor does the consistently awful texture work and low-res character models. But thankfully, the wastelands of each Fallout game still carry a lot of charm to them, just by the way they were designed. Stepping out into the world of a Fallout game is so exciting. Even though the quests remain the same, like the original two games, the order in which you do them is up to you, enabling you to explore new content, new dialogue options, and new endings, which almost make Fallout feel new each time you play it. That is, if you can accept the dissonance brought on by game design that competes with a realistic story. The core problem of Fallout is that the main objectives, finding a water chip, finding clean water for the wasteland, taking out a bad dude, finding a son, often get buried or forgotten under the weights of Fallout's other content, even though this content is often the highlight. Fallout's best and most urgent content often gets brushed to the side for quote-unquote activities or progression, such as helping someone clear bandit camps, building settlements that actually don't impact the story whatsoever, completing quests for the railroad that are again arbitrary, or taking parts in pointless bitch work like Rescue from Paradise or Nuka-Cola from Fallout 3. Side content is fine, but it's best when it's tied to what's going on in the main story, and often it's not in a Fallout game. In fact, I often wandered for hours, participating in a variety of content just to fill up my experience bar, despite more pressing concerns like, I don't know, saving the wasteland. And as the franchise kept growing, more of this optional content simply got in the way of progressing through these more important story items, climaxing in what I believe to be the worst Fallout game, Fallout 4. While I do appreciate the grand scale of the game, it's not hard to argue that this was the biggest what the hell moment for Fallout. Finally, we have a Fallout game that starts off really quickly with the main objective of finding your kidnapped son as a very compelling reason to venture out into Fallout 4. Unfortunately, the masses of interwoven content holding it up is stretched so thin, often getting in your way or simply pulling you away from the prime conflict. No, I do not want to build another settlement. I personally felt that this game had the weakest optional content and in the greatest frequency and the most lackluster implementation of the most important feature of Fallout, which is cause and effect role-playing. It wasn't the fact that the content itself was bad, it was the fact that it wasn't tied to anything meaningful. On the contrary, New Vegas and Fallout 3 had some truly incredible content that was better constructed to fit within the narrative, from Tranquility Lane, Head of the State, Oasis, the Ghost Town Gunfight, which is one of the first missions in New Vegas and gets you pumped for the rest of the game, and Birds of a Feather. So I was more impressed by these two titles than anything that was offered in 4. Still, a certain degree of acceptance is required to enjoy a Fallout game, as most of the time it's up to you to carve out a decent story, accompanied by hours of walking around, asking people if they've seen a middle-aged man or if they can help you find a neighboring settlement to trigger the next story beat. These are the mundane moments of Fallout and could easily be perceived as boring, but it's the choice that sprouts from them that matters and the option to play the game how you want, kill who you want to kill, it help the causes important to you so that you get the ending you desire. Some people want that freedom, 
That playground, even though many Fallout experiences are inconsistent with holes never filled in, with combat that's weedy and passable at best. Companions, an afterthought, their backstories never explored or conveyed to the player, I'm looking at you Fallout 3, and a technical framework that would fit right at home 10 years ago. You've also got to be okay with systems that aren't quite integrated properly, such as Fallout's various survival mechanics, which sometimes feel tacked on. Or the strange sensation that people should definitely have more civilization hundreds of years after the Fallout in any given Fallout game that came after Fallout 2. That's definitely weird. Fallout is best when it brings Fallout back to its original vision. Gritty, grimy, morally ambiguous, hostile and oppressive and when it seeks to correct the failings of the game that came before it. And for me, that is Fallout New Vegas. Whoa, easy there, easy. You've been out cold a couple of days now. New Vegas was when Bethesda looked back at what made Fallout 1 and 2 good, fantastic writing and branching quest design, and a deep sense of RPG mechanics, and incorporated it into the mold of Fallout 3, while at the same time fixing its multiple issues. Fallout New Vegas feels more authentic, more mature, and more morally gut-twisting. It took the obtuse and often janky flow of Fallout 3 and condensed it down far, yet still offering the same freedom players had come to expect. Yet even more choice set upon the backdrop of one of the most beautiful imaginations of the former city of Las Vegas. This is where I fell in love with Fallout, as I saw the franchise at its best light since the first game. And during my final hour, I truly cared about what was going to happen, and my choice was clear as crystal. I hated the Legion, and it was a true question of carrying out justice I wanted to witness versus leaving the world of Fallout in a better place than it once was. And if you catch my drift, I think you know what choice I made. I often say that Fallout is a beautiful mess of ideas, often never coming together as a whole, but Fallout New Vegas is one it actually did. The Fallout franchise has been both great and terrible. You can pry apart each game and analyze both its geniuses and its continued misdoings. Fallout's storytelling, role-playing elements, choice, and openness are the qualities that make a great Fallout game, but they can also be done quite poorly. When that happens, and the combat is lackluster and the performance sucks, that's when you have a bad Fallout game in the making. But it looks like Fallout might have a bright future instead, with two mods made outside the Fallout studio, New California and Miami. Ironically, I'm more excited about these two games than Fallout 76, but time will tell where the future of Fallout really goes. Hey guys, I got a big announcement. I've got a brand new YouTube channel called Upward Strike, where I'm going to upload a variety of new and interesting videos for you guys to watch free of charge. Now, these are gonna be videos that are either A, full length downward thrust style videos that for whatever reason, just didn't make the cut to the main channel, B, some sort of vlogs, and C, any other kind of miscellaneous gaming or non-gaming related videos that I want to create. So if you guys wanna be some of my first subscribers, there is a link in the description as well as the pinned comment. Go over there, subscribe, because there's gonna be some awesome content. And yes, there are already two full length style downward thrust videos available on Upward Strike to watch right now, one of which is a Fallout video. So. Make sure to go over to Upward Strike and subscribe now. Thanks for watching guys, I really appreciate it. Make sure to leave your comments down below and have yourself a fantastic day.